Well, it's 4 p.m. Central, so we're going to get started. Um, hello, my name is Megan Phillip. I am the Executive Director of the Healthcare Council of Chicago, HC3. Um, and we are a member-led coalition of healthcare leaders and organizations that are influencing change here in Chicago. Um, today's program is going to focus on the state of the state around the topic of cost drivers as a part of our ongoing transformation series. Um, just a couple of things that this uh, session is going to be recorded. So if you have to leave early or want to share it with others, you can find it on our website post event at hc3.health. And um, throughout the program, if you have any questions whatsoever, I encourage you to just pop it in the chat function and our moderator will see what she can do to make it part of today's discussion. Um, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, David Smith, who is the co-founder and CEO of Third Horizon Strategies, as well as one of the co-founders of the Healthcare Council of Chicago. Uh, great, thanks, Megan. And thanks to uh, all of you who have uh, uh, jumped on and joined with us today. I know we've had a, a couple of conversations in recent weeks about COVID-19, uh, obviously a timely conversation right now, given um, uh, the uh, both uh, the resurgence and, and the higher case rate uh, volumes we're seeing around the country, but also the pinprick of light that we see at the end of this very long tunnel as we turn the calendar into 2021 and begin thinking about uh, our, our pathway out of this. Uh, and we are really excited uh, to have uh, Dr. Ashish Jha join us uh, for this discussion. Um, uh, Dr. Jha is the Dean of the School of Public Health and a Professor of uh, Health Services Policy and Practice uh, at the Brown School of Public Health. He was formerly at Harvard. Uh, he asked me to dispense with the long reading of his bio. I'm going to honor that. What I will say um, about Dr. Jha is I've, uh, I've had a couple of opportunities to interact with him uh, over the years and uh, have found him to always be very affable, very, uh, very inviting, gregarious. And if, you, if you're a purveyor of news, um, you will recognize that, that green and teal background uh, as he is constantly on television. Uh, Dr. Jha is every bit as authentic on television as he is in person. And so um, uh, the, the empathy he exhibits, I think, on this subject uh, comes through really well. And so, we are thrilled to, to have him um, uh, as, our, as our partner in this discussion. Uh, this afternoon, we're gonna cover um, the, the intersection between uh, what's happening with COVID-19, COVID-19 policy, talk a bit about the healthcare ecosystem, and really try to think a bit about the future and uh, what our, our collective expectations ought to be and the work we all need to do as we uh, roll our sleeves up and um, uh, and get to work and pushing our health system forward in 2021. So, Dr. Jha, thank you again so much for uh, agreeing to uh, uh, join us this afternoon, and the floor is yours. Great, great, David. Thank you, and Megan, thank you as well for the uh, invitation. I'm going to assume everybody can hear and see me, and if somehow you can't, you'll find a way to let me know. Um, so, as David said, uh, my name is Ashish Jha, and I'm uh, what I here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna to speak to all of you for about 20, 22 minutes. And I'm gonna to try to lay out five main points. And after I speak for that time, we're gonna get into a really fun discussion, I hope, where we can delve deeply into any of those points or go in a different direction. If we want to. And what I'm gonna to try to lay out is first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the state of this current and uh, the second thing I'm gonna tell you is that we are uh, entering an age of pandemics and that we should be fully uh, ready for more of these in the future. And I'll try to lay out the case for why. Uh, and then I'm gonna shift to talking about the impact of the pandemic on the healthcare system. So we talk a lot about, a lot about the impact on health. Uh, and then I'm gonna try to come up with what I think are the major lessons learned. And then last but certainly not least, I'm gonna look a little bit into the future and say, what does this all mean for things like payment reform and healthcare spending and workforce and all those issues. And because I'm gonna to try to cover all of that in about 20, 22 minutes, I'm not gonna do any of it full justice, uh, but my hope is it gives us enough uh, that, that we can really have, a, have that broader conversation. after. So let's talk about the state of the pandemic, where we are uh, in the pandemic. And the way I look at it, I, if, for those of you who might've uh, heard me before, uh, really since March, April, but certainly by June, 
I started using a baseball analogy. And as a Red Sox fan, uh, and again, please don't hold that against me for any of you who might be Cubs fans. Um, you know, I've used uh, the, the idea of this pandemic as a nine inning baseball. Game. And, uh, and I'll explain why I, I use that. And what I would argue is that we are somewhere around the bottom of the sixth inning. Uh, bottom of the sixth inning is good, right? If you want to get the game over. Uh, bottom of the sixth inning means we've got a lot of the game behind us already. We're probably about two thirds of the way through. Uh, we're not done with the bottom of the sixth inning, but we're in the bottom of the sixth. Uh, but we still have some ways to go. There's still work ahead of us. So let me lay out why I use, uh, why I say that, why I say we're at the bottom of the sixth inning. I have thought about this as about an 18 month pandemic. Uh, now, I'll give you my, my landmarks and I'll explain why it's a, it's a pretty good thumbnail sketch of where they we're going to be. And I'll give you the caveats. Around it. I think of this pandemic beginning around January 1st of this year and coming under control around June 30th of 2021. That's 18 months. So why do I pick those two markers? Um, the pandemic probably began sometime in late October, early November. That's probably about when the, there was a, uh, a, a, um, a jump of the virus from a bat or another animal to a human in China, probably in Wuhan. And the virus started circulating in, in late October, early November and circulated through much of November. And I suspect that in December, it was well outside of Wuhan across much of China. And by probably mid to late December, it was in Europe. It was probably in, in parts of the Western United States. Uh, but it's December 31st, 2019, is when the Chinese government told WHO, uh, we have a problem. And it was on January 1st of this year, WHO, literally the next day, stood up in office to say, we're going to have to sort out what's happening. So that to me is the marker of the beginning of the pandemic, when the world first becomes aware that there may be a problem. So if we get going on January 1st, why do I think June 30th is when the pandemic begins to essentially get under control? I think by June 30th of next year, so six months from now, um, we will have enough vaccines widely available. I am hopeful we will have enough people vaccinated that the pandemic will be under very substantial control. Do I think the pandemic will be gone? Do I think like the virus will be gone? No, we'll still be dealing with the virus. But it will not affect our lives the way it does now. The fact that I'm speaking to all of you through Zoom, I bet in July, especially under certain circumstances, we could get together and I could do this talk in front of an audience. Uh, maybe it would be a little more spaced out. Maybe we'd be wearing masks. But the point is we could do things very, very differently um, starting by July. So I really think end of June, life will look very different. So if that timeline makes sense, 18 months is the pandemic. We're in the 12th month of that 18 months. So that's the bottom of the sixth day. And where we are right now, let me just make one more point before I switch to talking about how we're entering an age of pandemics, is that the sixth and seventh inning are, are gonna be the worst. They are gonna be the worst of the whole pandemic. So this month and January are going to be worse than you expect it to be. Uh, I have been um, surprised at how much people are underestimating how bad things are right now. And we are still in exponential growth in many parts of the country. Uh, things are pretty bad in Illinois. They're pretty bad in Massachusetts. They're bad in many, many places across the country. Uh, and we have some ways to go. Uh, there's enough infection baked in that we're gonna continue seeing very high levels of infections. But really the biggest issue is the buckling of the healthcare system uh, under pressure. And we're starting to see that with some early metrics uh, in many, many parts of the country. And the difference between now and April is that in April, it was in a few regions, now it's everywhere. And in April, the primary problem was supplies, PPEs, ventilators, hospital beds. Now it's people, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, we're just running out of them. And so I am deeply worried about how bad uh, things will be uh, in December or January. So as I said, I think we're underestimating how bad things are gonna be for December, January. I think we're also underestimating how good things are gonna be once you get into March, April, May. Uh, February is that transition month where we go from like horrible starts turning around. And I really think March, April, May is going to be much, much better. 
and you will see life really starting to get back to a, some version of normal. And that's why I think by the end of June, things will feel meaningfully better. And all of this is vaccinations. And let me make one last point and then I'm gonna switch is that you know one of the things that people somehow think with vaccines is you gotta get to some herd immunity number before it makes a difference. Even if we get to 20% of Americans vaccinated on top of the fact that we've got 20, 25% of Americans who've been infected, uh, we will start making a really big difference in terms of the uh, dynamics of this disease. It will start slowing down a lot. So I do think we can get to 10 or 20%, 20% vaccinated by the end of February. And that will really make a big difference. That's why I'm very optimistic about late winter, spring being much, much better than people think. Okay, so that's the state of the pandemic. Happy to get into more details. Uh, let's talk a little bit about why I made the relatively provocative comment that we're entering an age of pandemics. So why do I say that? So I wanna tell you a little story of, of uh, some work that we did back in 2015, we I put together a commission to look at how we prevent future pandemics. And it was really driven by what was happening with Ebola in 2014 in West Africa. And, in, and, and that actually led to a, a course that I put together at Harvard. And in that course in 2015, I asked every expert that I had a conversation with as part of that course, I would finish every conversation with one question, which was, again, this is 2015, I would say in five years, in 2020, if there is a global pandemic, will the world be ready? And the answer every single person gave me was no, the world will not be ready. And so the question is like, am I somehow this prescient person who knew there was gonna be a global pandemic in 2020? No, I had no idea it was gonna be in 2020. But it was very clear to me and lots of other people that we were heading towards a global pandemic. And so the question is, why were we all so worried about this? And we were worried about this uh, because a few things. One is disease outbreaks have been rising. They've been rising across the world. If you look at novel diseases affecting humans, that happens from time to time, that the frequency with which that's happening is going up and up and up. Um, so what, what's driving that? The single biggest thing that's driving that is human animal interaction. So here's a key point. Most novel human infections are infections that come from animals, that is, there is some species of virus or bacteria or fungus that is endemic in an animal population. Humans haven't encountered it or maybe humans haven't gotten sick from it. There is a species jump and all of a sudden humans get it and it takes off. Um, that is the mechanism by which most new diseases, new disease outbreaks happen. That's happening more frequently, largely because of environmental changes. Um, people are encroaching into animal habitats. People are eating more meat. Um, and uh, climate change. And climate change is really changing the, the context in which these things are happening. I raise all of this to say, like, this is the future. And all of these things that I described, none of them are going away. Something else that's not going away is economic growth. Now, economic growth is a really good thing, right? It, it helps people live healthier, happier lives. But economic growth means a few things. It means people are more likely to consume meat. It means um, that we do get things like deforestation and, and, and encroachment and into environmental uh, things. And I'm not suggesting, and obviously we need to be environmentally good stewards. I'm not saying those are bad things. I am saying the natural consequence of those things is more disease outbreaks. And then the last, but certainly not least, is globalization. So in 2003, there was a SARS outbreak. It was a very close cousin to the current SARS virus. And in China, it ended up affecting Hong Kong, it ended up affecting Toronto, but it didn't quite become global. And there were two reasons. One is it was a less infectious virus, probably the most important reason. But a second was China was a totally different country. It was, hard, it was not nearly as globalized, but the amount of travel happening within China in the last decade, and now in the last five years, the amount of travel happening outside of, from, of Chinese outside is unprecedented. India is about to undergo the same thing over the next decade as is the entire, not the entire, but much of the African continent. And so globalization means a ton more travel and it means diseases spread faster and become more global more quickly. That's the reality of the world we are living in and that's the reality of the world we're gonna be living in for a long time, right? And I raise all of this because it means that once this pandemic is over, 
we, what we cannot do is go, oh, that was awful. Let's never have that again and go back to business as usual. There is this, if this is not a wake up call to what is coming, uh, I think we're gonna have a problem. And it means now in a shift to my third thing, it really means that we have to think about our healthcare system in the context of not just this pandemic, but how to survive future ones and hopefully do better in future ones. And in order to do that, I wanna talk a little bit about what has happened uh, with this pandemic in terms of the healthcare system. So one of the biggest ironies, of course, is in the middle of the biggest health crisis of a century, one of the sectors of our economy that's been most devastated is healthcare. It's really strange. Like that doesn't, on some level, it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't make sense. You should all look at that and go, how could that be? And the reason is because of the effects of the health of the pandemic on everything from in-person uh, visits, uh, loss of elective surgeries and elective procedures, um, all of the things that people have foregone because the healthcare system could not manage all of that and manage the surge of cases in COVID. And obviously some of it in the, in the spring was really driven by fear. People didn't know. And so even where hospitals were quite empty, people didn't go because they were worried. What is happening now is you're starting to see cancellations uh, and a healthcare system really buckling under pressure uh, because uh, not as much driven by fear, but just driven by the fact that we have so many infections and then so many of those people who got infected end up getting quite sick and needing hospital care. And the reason why this has been so problematic in my mind is that our payment systems are not, were not, are not designed to handle this, right? And so we have actually, I think the healthcare system has performed pretty admirably given all of these challenges. We've seen huge increases in telemedicine and distance, uh, distance sort of health. We've seen um, obviously heroism from physicians and nurses and other frontline providers. So lots of good things have come out of it. But we've also seen huge effects on mental health, large drops in preventive services. Uh, and of course, we've seen large financial impacts on hospitals and healthcare systems across the board. So that has been the real impact on the healthcare system that we need to do some thinking about. Um, and that gets me to really just make my last set of points, which is what I think are the major lessons learned and how we think about improving the future. So um, in terms of thinking about the lessons learned, I, I do think that the, the incredible appreciation that the American people have for physicians and nurses and what they've done will be an important component of what happens in the future when we think about health reform. So in, in 2021 or 2022, if we get into payment reform and all of a sudden, let's say the CMS administrator says, you know, we're gonna cut payments to physicians. That's gonna be much, much harder in this context when physicians have, I think rightly, earned so much goodwill for the work that they've done. So I think some of these things really do affect uh, the politics and, and the policy options. I feel the same way about pharma. Uh, pharma was, was getting uh, pretty bruised before the pandemic. Uh, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson soon and, and others, AstraZeneca, are gonna deliver life-saving vaccines. And it's gonna be much harder to vilify them or to really take them on from a big policy point of view uh, given what has happened. So I think th that that's a bit more policy and politics, but I do think that the political um, space for reform is going to be constrained a little bit by some of these uh, entities that really have come out as uh, our saviors in this system. Um, I, I think there's one other thing that gets a lot of, has gotten a lot of attention and rightly so, which is that the healthcare system with all of its challenges has performed admirably in managing patients with COVID. And I, and I like to sort of use the statistic that the average person who was, let's say, infected and got really sick and got admitted to a hospital in March, take that same person getting admitted to a hospital today, their chances of dying are probably 50, maybe 70% lower today than they were in March. Some of that is therapies, remdesivir, maybe dexamethasone, certainly. But a lot of it is really just physicians and nurses learning how to provide better care. And that rapid learning has really been quite powerful. And again, I think teaches us the resilience of our system uh, in terms of what it can do. I will say as, as uh, but 
a couple of things that have not worked, I've alluded to them, are payment models. Fee-for-service systems really don't function well, and they particularly don't function well uh, in the ambulatory setting. We've seen primary care practices left, right, and center go out of business. We've seen hospitals, a lot of them are buckling, and you're going to see a big push towards mergers of large health systems. Uh, because you have multiple health systems that are going to start getting into real financial problems. And, uh, and so there is going to be a new, oh, and then one last thing is there's going to be a huge impetus to expand access, especially under a Biden administration. This idea that you could be uninsured in the middle of a health crisis like a pandemic is a huge problem. I think most Americans are going to understand that. And there is going to be a push to figure out how to expand access. I don't think, no matter what happens with the Senate, um, I don't see this like becoming a Medicare for all situation, but I do see fixes to the Affordable Care Act, tweaks to the ACA, some of which will probably require congressional action uh, that will focus on expanding access. So let me just finish up by saying, I think, you know, this pandemic has been really hard on everybody, all of us. Uh, we have more months behind us than we do ahead of us. That's good. Uh, and while we have a couple of really hard months ahead, uh, there is a light at the end, end of this tunnel and that light is very bright and it's getting closer and closer. I think uh, as we emerge from this pandemic, there are gonna be some fundamental questions that are gonna be in front of us in the policy world. Um, one is certainly how do we rebuild our healthcare systems? What do we do about large systems that are gonna to wanna to merge with other large systems in terms of issues like, what do we do about antitrust and what do we do about competition? Uh, those will be all really important issues at play. There is going to be a very substantial interest in investing in the public health infrastructure. Our public health system just failed, did not have the resources. Uh, we could not stand up a testing and tracing infrastructure. We did not have a, a public health workforce that could really deliver mostly because we just hadn't put any money into it. We didn't have a public health infrastructure that could collect data about how many infections and hospitalizations there were. It took us months to put that stuff up. I think there are gonna be very large investments in those areas. And there's some really interesting policy and strategic questions for healthcare delivery systems that actually have a lot of capacity to do public health in a community, to ask the question, what role do, do, does the healthcare system wanna play in public health? It's a, it's a question that makes the public health people very worried because they think the healthcare system will end up coming and gobbling them up. But I actually think there's a really important role that healthcare systems could play. And we could talk more about that, but that I think is gonna be really, uh, really, really important. Um, so I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of changes ahead. One last point, you know, after the 1918 pandemic, um, the decade that followed, uh, led to very dramatic changes in how healthcare was organized, how healthcare was funded, how doctors were trained. And I think you can trace a lot of it to the 1918 pandemic. And I think in the same way, some of the journeys that we have been on in our healthcare system towards more alternative payment models, away from fee-for-service, rethinking the role of doctors and nurses, all of that is going to be accelerated in a very dramatic way over the next five years. None of it is faded. We don't know how it'll all end, but it's really up to us uh, to shape it so that we end up with a healthcare system that's more resilient, higher quality, and more uh, affordable yeah. to most Americans. All right, so I am going to stop with those comments and I'm gonna turn it back to Megan, who I think will bring in uh, my uh, interlocutor, my um, colleague who's with whom we're going to have a discussion. Megan. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jia. And thank you so much for your comments so far. And there's already some questions coming in. So I just want to remind everyone to just use the chat function and chat to um, everyone or just to the panelists. And we'll, we'll see those and make sure that we can address those. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce one of our HC3 members to moderate a uh, discussion, um, Lynn Hanessian, who um, comes from Edelman. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and I am delighted to be here. And I will say, um, Dr. Zhao, you have laid out a feast of possible choices for conversation. Um, but I do want to start, and, and I think you've given us some hopeful thoughts that there might be change, that we might find uh, finally that healthcare access is really, really uh, urgent and that it's unacceptable that we're not able to deliver that. Um, for so people who think that's going to be a complex issue with a divided Congress, 
and Americans with short attention spans, where, where is the, the, the sort of core driver that we should be thinking about and where is a sort of bipartisan approach without getting into politics, but the prospect of getting something done, I think is a paramount concern. Yeah. And uh, that if we could just explore that a little bit, it would be great to hear. Yeah, I, I do think um, that there is a broad coalition of people um, across the political spectrum, maybe not at the extremes, um, who want to make sure that everybody has coverage. How we do it, where we do it, the role of government, the role of the private sector, that's where it starts, that broad coalition starts fraying a little bit. And my sense is that um, no action at all on the uninsured is going to be very hard uh, in two ways. I think Mr. Biden, uh, President-elect Biden, will uh, feel compelled uh, to do something on coverage. I think he's made that a key part of his thing. And then his coalition is going to demand it. Um, I don't think that he's going to even try. And I don't think there's going to be any policy appetite for like a massive overall of the healthcare system, i.e. Medicare for all. And therefore, what I see is a bunch of tweaks to the Affordable Care Act. All right, uh, so some changes in the way that we do exchanges, uh, some changes to the subsidies, push for those other 12 states that have not expanded Medicaid to expand Medicaid. Um, I, I think if you just expanded Medicaid in those 12 states, if you did a little bit of a stabilization of the, of the exchanges, right now we're at about 90% insured, you could get to 97, 98% insured. And that may be as good as we do, but 97, 98 is pretty close to universal coverage. Um, so I, I think that's where the push is going to be. I think that's where the politics is going to allow for. And I don't know why I'm saying this, because I have no uh, crystal ball uh, and I'm not a political analyst, but I, I'm hopeful that there will be enough momentum so that we get to a point where pretty much every American has health coverage. So um, I'm going to turn to one of the questions that came in, and I will tell you, we have a pretty smart crew of folks posing questions at us. Um, and it's really one around, what do you see from a policy perspective around hospital affiliations and mergers um, in medically underserved and rural communities? Um, do you think they will be receiving uh, uh, more, uh, more favorable treatment, as it were, under the next administration? Mergers. Uh, mergers. Um, or, or even, frankly, I heard a conversation last week around affiliations being perhaps the lifeblood to some of our rural hospitals. Um, do, do we think that we'll be balancing capacity from a regulatory and, and policy perspective to keep that going? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, I don't. I mean, part of it is I don't know that much about uh, you know Mr. Biden's uh, views or his team's views on. Uh, competition, but the FTC has been reasonably nonpartisan in the sense that their actions have not shifted dramatically, as far as I can see in healthcare, based on, let's say, the Bush administration versus the Obama administration. And um, so I, what I expect is probably more leeway around uh, rural health systems, rural healthcare and affiliations. So that part of it, Lynn, I do see probably giving people a lot of a, you know, a lot more slack. I think where we're going to get into continued scrutiny is when you have, let's say, two large health systems uh, in a single geographic area who want to merge. And they're going to make the claim that financially they're both in trouble because of COVID. And they're not going to be wrong in the sense that there are going to be financial hits. Uh, but I think the FTC is still going to ask questions, the hard questions, like, do you have to merge to fix this? Or couldn't you fix it some other way? So I, I expect a certain amount of skepticism, but I expect the merger movement that we saw for a while that slowed down to really pick back up again in the next uh, next year or two. Um, in terms of the silver linings from uh, the, as, as some of my colleagues like to refer to it, the regulatory loosening yeah. around telemedicine and digital innovations, um, how do we think about that in terms of meeting the needs? I'm gonna, gonna take a little twist on this with disparate communities because I'm concerned 
as we've seen some of those solutions come out, we go into some communities and some places in Chicago where digital access is a real, real hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. So let me take that on in two ways, Lynn. Um, first, it's actually a broader point than just the regulatory relaxation, but it is an important issue that the person asking the question raises, which is, it is very tempting to think, well, once the pandemic kind of comes to an end, we'll go back. And, you know, pandemics are one way paths. There's no going back. There's no 2019 version in our future. Um, 2021 will be better than 2020, but it will not look like 2019. And the big picture point is that you can't put you can't put this back in the bottle. You can't be like, okay, we're going to go back to the old policy on telemedicine. Who wants that? We're not going to do that. It is also really tempting to believe that it's all going to stick and everything is going to be totally different. I actually think it's going to be a mix where um, there's definitely going to be regulatory relaxation. It's going to be very hard to push things back to the way they were pre-pandemic. Uh, partly because people get used to it and partly because people like it and it works for a lot of people. So why would we want to go back? In fact, what has happened with telemedicine was a long time coming, it's just that the pandemic accelerated. But telemedicine also, like we also saw the limitations of telemedicine. As much as I've been a big fan, and part of it is I'm a bit of a technophile, so I'm like, I've been a fan of telemedicine for a long time. We also saw the limitations of it. For a lot of people, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work well enough. So we're going to have to come up with new models that become hybrids of technology and in-person. And we're going to have a lot, need to have a lot more flexibility. So I think a lot of this stuff is going to stick for a long time. You know, on the issue of, of how to think about this for underserved communities, it is going to be really important because we often talk about, well, when people could just zoom in, not everybody, believe it or not, uh, not everybody has access to broadband. Not everybody has access to computers where they can just zoom in. And it's one thing to say to people, well, do it on your smartphone. That doesn't really sound really a great uh, physician experience, especially if you have chronic diseases and et cetera. So I think we're gonna have to think about what to do to improve access to some of these things in, in communities uh, where people, there's more poor people, communities of color. Um, so big picture point, we're not going back. It's gonna be a hybrid of new systems and we're gonna have to pay particular attention to these uh, traditionally underserved groups. So, so adjacent to the hospital health system merger question, uh, we have a question, health system mergers typically lead to consolidation of payers. Um, what do you see as a next step in the payer landscape? Yeah, um, you know, one of my favorite um, uh, thinkers on this topic is a guy named Marty Gaynor. Uh, Marty is at CMU in Pittsburgh. And he says, you know, uh, two consolidated markets are not better than one. And it's a great point. And, you know, one of the things that pairs often say is we need to consolidate to deal with the market power of the provider. I've also heard the argument from providers, we need to consolidate to deal with the market power of the pair. Um, when you get both sides consolidated, uh, there's only one group that loses and that's the consumer. Um, so that's kind of a principle from Marty. Now, the, the point I would, I would make here is one of the things that's been really interesting in the last few years. I mean, yes, there's been payer consolidation, there's been provider consolidation, but there's actually been like unusual types of tie-ups, right? The, the Aetna and CVS, not what one would immediately think of kind of in the, in the, so there's all of these kinds of things that are happening that I think we're going to see a lot more of. We're going to see uh, a lot more of people getting into other people's businesses. And, uh, you know, and, and my only point on that is, so the short answer is like provider, I mean, payer consolidation is like not great for consumers and, and you know, more competition is better. But the issue around people getting into other people's businesses is there's one point that people often miss that I think is really important and that's expertise. Um, you can like, you know, there are a lot of provider organizations who are like, why do I even need a payer? I'll just create my own insurance. It's, there's a difference between having an insurance license and knowing how to manage risk uh, and really knowing how to do, uh, how to be an effective payer. So I think there's, 
going to be a lot of these kinds of efforts of people getting into other people's businesses and a lot of them won't work because there's a lot of expertise necessary that you don't automatically develop. I, I think it's going to be a very dynamic landscape. We're going to have to watch it closely. I always like dynamic landscape, especially when you want the system to work better. I like people experimenting with new approaches. Well, so there's an interesting implication that I think takes that question to this next one. Um, certainly, uh, as, as one questioner notes, the Obama administration had difficulty getting uh, everyone together in the healthcare sector to get on board with ACA. And I myself was talking to a client in the pharmaceutical sector today who knows that people still want the industry scalp for having supported uh, ACA. Um, with this kind of vertical integration, um, so you might, you've got power consolidation perhaps, uh, revenue consolidation, do we really think that all these industries within healthcare are gonna be willing to uh, negotiate and expand healthcare and reduce costs? Is that gonna be a lever for expansion? So I think there's gonna be political will for expanding access. And remember, it's a funny, it's a funny thing, right, because um, people often say, well, there was, you know, what the opposition to the ACA was. At the end of the day, most industry players were happy for an expansion. And if you forget the moral issues, forget the public health benefits. If you look at this from a very narrow self-interest point of view, do the insurers want lots of more people to be insured? Yes, it turns out they do. Do providers want more of their patients to have insurance? Well, it turns out they do. So there is a natural alignment of payers, providers. Do pharmaceutical companies want more potential customers to have health insurance because it'll allow them to buy their products? It turns out they do. So pretty much the, the, the coalition that needs to be built to expand coverage, I think is a natural coalition, I think it will come together and support bringing everybody else on board. And again, I'm not suggesting that all these guys are all just purely narrowly interested. I, I think people are complex and I think people are, you know, deeply care about coverage expansion. So I, I don't at all mean to suggest, but I also think it's naturally aligns. I think the cost control is where it gets totally different because anything you do to reduce costs is somebody's revenue loss, right? And so this is where it starts getting very complicated. So if you say, well, we want public option because it's an option to reduce administrative costs in the private payer side, I'm not sure that insurers love that uh, because they think the government can bring certain types of power and lever to the marketplace that a private business can't. Um, you know, once you get into saying, well, we want to reduce doctor payments and hospital payments as a way to control costs, no surprise doctors and hospitals don't love that. So I, I think the coalition, the political coalition for cost control is much, much harder to pull off. And um, I think it's gonna happen to the extent that happens at all towards ongoing changes in payment models. And that's what's gonna drive any improvements in quality and cost. But I don't know that the Biden administration is gonna really take this on in a big way, the cost part. I think they will take on the coverage part. I hope they take on the cost part, don't get me wrong. I just don't know if they will. They're gonna have a lot of other issues to be dealing with. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say, I'm really struck and as this pandemic has gone on, um, a healthy population equals a healthy economy. And Absolutely. so the, 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 the difficulty in helping people to realize that if we invest in keeping people healthy, we will have a better world um, is, a, is, a, is a fascinating one from my uh, mindset. Uh, we have a couple of questions about personal behavior. Um, and, and one of them uh, is, is uh, you know, when we talked a little bit about that sort of uh, one world model around uh, environment and climate and animal human interaction, um, do we think a shift to a more plant-based diet gets us out of the meat interface? It's a really good question. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna give a slightly personal answer, which is I just had an impossible burger recently for the first time. And it was really good. Like, it was really good. I think if I, had, if I hadn't liked it, I probably would give a slightly different answer. Um, so in the short run, no, in the long run, maybe, and probably. In the short run, no, because when you look at what is happening in India, in China, across the African continent, 
meat consumption is skyrocketing. It is skyrocketing. One of my colleagues, I, I did a lot of travel to uh, Asia over the last couple of years. And one of the co my colleagues that I often traveled with, she's vegetarian. Like across China, it was almost impossible to get a meal because every meal, the, the idea was it's meat, 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 and meat on every course. Um, and, and just because like that is a sign of wealth and, and prosperity. So that's going to be very hard to replace that level of consumption anytime in the, in the short, like over the next five, 10 years. So 20 years down the road, I have no idea, maybe. But the issues that are going to drive meat consumption in the short run are going to continue to be really a challenge for the next five, 10 years. And I, again, I, I liked my Impossible Burger, but I don't think you can do that enough at enough of a scale uh, to deal with the growing appetite for meat across the world. Yeah. I, I also think that the other dimension to it is, frankly, environmental encroachment. As we see the conversion of the Amazon, as we see you know, expanding industrialization, um, that gets us right in the face of animals. That's the interface that we have to really worry about. Um, right, yeah. And I was just gonna say, it's not, I mean, you know, people somehow think, you know, this is environmental versus economic development. I, I think that's a little too simplistic. Um, what we're learning is environmental encroachment. Like think about this pandemic. It's one of the consequences, environmental encroachment. Pretty economically devastating. We have a, another personal behavior question and it is about vaccine hesitancy. Um, uh, what's gonna be the most effective way to change the mind of the roughly 40% of the population uh, who according to Pew are going to be reluctant to get the vaccine? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Doing a lot of thinking about this. Um, I think first of all, like that 40% needs to be kind of broken down into different buckets. Um, there are really hardcore anti-vaccine people and I think we should try to engage them, but I don't, I'm not super optimistic uh, that we're gonna um, win everybody over. We don't need to. We do need to get to 70, 80% vaccination rate though. If we really, you know, the, I, I've been saying to folks that um, July 4th, 2021 is our real independence day um, where life will start feeling like we've been kind of, we've gotten rid of this pandemic. Uh, we'll still be dealing with the virus, but it'll just be much better. And in order for that to happen, 70, 80% of Americans need to get vaccinated. Uh, and, you know, I'm hoping that in Massachusetts, uh, where I live, um, uh, that could happen. Uh, that could happen. But it's not a no brainer. So, how do we go from 50, 60% of Americans saying, I'm willing to take it? 80% actually taking it. So first of all, you don't need everybody. Second is you got to understand what is making people hesitant and address it uh, in multiple ways. One part of what's making people hesitant is, boy, this vaccine development has gone so fast. People just worry that we've somehow cut corners or we haven't. And so a lot of it is, and what I've been trying to do in my public communication is explain to people that every step of a vaccine testing regimen that we have for any other vaccine, these vaccines have gone through all of them. They've gone through full phase three trials, actually bigger phase three trials than we usually do for vaccines. Um, so we haven't cut any corners. Uh, we've met every, every uh, goalpost, but part of it is explaining that and communicating that. I think second thing is watching lots of people get vaccinated will help a lot, right? you'll see people you know get vaccinated and I think that will start creating some assurance. And then I think third is really getting powerful messengers. So it's not, uh, you know, there are certain communities that are more hesitant than others finding trusted voices in those communities uh, to become advocates is gonna become very, very important. Uh, so a couple questions about the future of primary care. So what do you think about the future of a primary care practice? a PCP transformation to better support care delivery after the pandemic with a sidebar of cost. So what the cost and reimbursement side of this, how do we need to align that um, with the PCP movement? Yeah, can I, can I just say that of all the things where I feel like I have more clarity or less clarity, this is one I probably have less clarity. I struggle with this question. It's, uh, it's an enormously important one and so let me maybe say a few things about it. Could I imagine a ton of consolidation of these practices where um, systems go and buy them up because these practices are struggling? Absolutely, that is entirely a possibility. 
Um, can I imagine that a bunch of practices are going to try to make a go of it and get through this, um, but really will need an alternative payment models because fee for service, the traditional one is going to get harder and harder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are going to be a bunch of competing forces. And on issues like, are we really going to be able to continue to do patient-centered medical homes and pay for uh, different ways of, of delivering primary care? I hope, so when I say I'm confused or I, I have less visibility, it is not because I am unclear about what I want, right? I want primary care practices to be really strongly supported. I'd like to have primary care practices get the resources to do that practice transformation. Um, I just, I struggle a little bit about how is that going to work? Will it work? And who's going to pay for it? And is CMS and going to continue to put up resources? Are payers going to continue to put up resources? In some places they will, but I also see in lots of places uh, large scale consolidation of health systems buying up practices. And generally, those don't tend to lead to a whole bunch of improvements in quality or patient experience. So I've got a, got a, got a question that touches on uh, our uh, outpatient care. One is picking up on the CVS Aetna partnership, what's the future for outpatient care? And I'm just gonna throw in, cause we're Chicago and we're the headquarters for it. We also see the Walgreen Village MD tie up. I mean, are these new models that might reorient or re-deliver care to uh, consumers in a way that would be worthwhile? They're gonna try, they're gonna try, right? And you know, it's interesting. Uh, um, I think about, for instance, my, uh, so I have three children um, and they're all school age and we have great pediatrician that we love and we go to the pediatrician for most things. But there are plenty of days when one of the, our kids pre-pandemic wakes up with a sore throat and we think we could make an appointment with the pediatrician and it's gonna do this and that and I'll just go to the CVS. And in 20 minutes we have a strep test. And we do that sometimes, right? Um, CVS knows that, and therefore CVS knows that they have an in into us. And my sense of CVS is they're gonna wanna build that out more um, to say, great, I'm glad you come to us for the sore throat, also come to us for the sports physical. So they're doing that now. We, we try to, again, this is all pre-pandemic. We One of our kids needed a sports physical. Our pediatrician was like, it'll take four weeks. CVS was like, how about four o'clock this afternoon? We did it. So. I think CVS and these guys are going to try a bunch of these things and they're going to in, kind of pick off more and more services and keep expanding and keep encroach, encroaching. Uh, you know, it's not like the primary care physicians have a right to a certain thing, but keep encroaching into what has been traditional primary care. And I think that's going to create some tensions. I think it's also going to create more opportunities for, con for consumers and patients. So yeah, I, I don't know where all this goes, but I think this is going to be a very dynamic play uh, marketplace where you're going to see lots of new models being tried out. So let's go to the other end of life um, on the issue of Medicare physician fee schedules oh, with no. a 10% reduction in the MPFS due to kick in January 1. Uh, what do you see happening around access to care, especially in at-risk communities? Yeah, I don't know if I have any particular insights. Um, you know, I uh, obviously that payment uh, issue is you're going to get a lot of pushback. As I, I, I don't, I could speculate. Let me just go back to a point I made earlier, um, which is I think you're going to see the physician community speak much more loudly about these kinds of cuts in a way that is going to resonate. Again, you're seeing doctors on the front lines battling COVID, and then you want to cut their payments by 10%. It's going to feel really policy-wise awkward. So I am skeptical that over the long run, we're going to see lots of these kinds of things. But to the extent that they happen, uh, they are going to pose challenges for providers who have, let's say, for whom Medicare is their best payer because the rest of their payment mix is Medicaid and uninsured. You know, if Medicare is a tiny part and you mostly just do private insurance, you could probably live with it. You might complain about it, but you can live with it. But if Medicare is your best payer and everybody else is Medicaid or, or, or self-pay, it's going to be a huge problem. And so you're going to see a mobilization to push back on some of these kinds of things. So, I, you know, I think the other thing that we um, recognize now is that healthcare does not just happen in a conversation between us and our doctor and inside a neat clinic with insurance. 
uh, we recognize the social determinants of health play a, a much more uh, impactful role in our outcomes overall. Um, do we think, particularly as we think about uh, seniors and older adults that will see the pace of Medicare Advantage and similar programs accelerate when we're talking about social factors and living environments? Yeah, there are two parts, of, there are two questions I think embedded in there. One is, are we gonna see things like MA really expand and, and get bigger and, and grow? I mean, it's obviously grown a lot in the last five, 10 years. I think the answer is yes. I don't see anything that slows down MA um, anytime soon. I don't see the, you know, I don't see the Biden administration. Uh, again, I really don't know. I mean, I, I, and by the way, just to be clear, I have no affiliation with the Biden transition team. Don't speak for them. Uh, so just to be very, very clear on that. Um, but I don't see them taking on MA in any kind of a negative way. So I expect more growth of MA. Um, the question around like, will play, will things like MA do more on social determinants? I think they will. I think they're going to be selective. I think they're going to pick on a few specific areas for a few specific seniors. So not broad plans like everybody in the MA plan gets free housing. <laughs> That's not going to happen. But you can imagine more targeted efforts that say, okay, we will provide some level of potential housing support for a small group of seniors for whom Without that, what we're seeing is these huge increases in costs and huge problems with, with uh, health and well-being. So I can imagine MA plans starting to do more of those kinds of things. So I, I do expect more investments in social determinants, but very targeted into a few specific areas. So unlike Taiwan, we did not get our contact tracing and testing game together. Yeah. Do we think um, that there is a strategy here for rebuilding for our next pandemic around the corner. Is that a federal? Is that a state? How does that happen? Um, what's the what's the best play to try and move our our phones not only as a source of distraction but a source of health for us? Yeah. So I think um, you are absolutely going to see huge investments by the public and the private sector around um, our testing capabilities. I mean, probably the there are many failures in our pandemic response, but certainly one of the biggest is our um, really inability to build the kind of testing infrastructure we needed. And so you're gonna, and, and those are, and by the way, there just have been massive investments in diagnostic testing capacity over the last six months. And all of those investments are starting to come online now. And I believe that by June, July, one of the reasons I say we're gonna have our Independence Day on July 4th is not just because we'll have vaccines, but we will have ubiquitous testing. And we'll have it for two reasons, the technology and the companies have made the investments and we're gonna have a federal government that's gonna be very invested, interested in putting in resources into that. Uh, certainly the Biden administration has made that very clear. So, um, so testing, absolutely. On tracing, the question is, there is gonna be a push to put more resources into public health agencies to build up a test a tracing uh, uh, core that maybe will do other things during normal times, but can be mobilized almost a little bit like the National Guard. The other way to think about this, and I've sort of brought this up with people, is to think about it really like the National Guard in the sense that, well, not really like, we don't actually need to use the National Guard, but to, that's an idea. What I mean is, National Guard people have day jobs under normal times, right? Like they're our colleagues and friends. And then they go get training every once in a while and in the middle of a, of a military emergency, they get called up. And so you can imagine partnering with health systems that say, you know, like there are a lot of, of your employees, a lot of your nurses, a lot of your other healthcare staff who we're gonna train in how to do these things. And they'll need to get refreshers any, every once in a while, but mostly they'll do their day job. And then the next time there's an outbreak, we're going to call up a bunch of people, and that's a that's a model because that then you're using the utilization you're using the healthcare workforce that already exists, providing them some additional training and then and then pulling them when you need them. So I think we're going to see different states do these kinds of things, and I think you're going to see the federal government uh, uh, give them a lot of opportunities. Um, and, and do you think our experience with this is going to put us in a better place? Should we really? Well, I don't want to underestimate the virulence of this pathogen, but even the prospect of one even more uh, 
virulent and certainly things like, you know, measles as a model is very, very transmissible. So, to, so do you think we'll be better equipped for something even worse when we're done here? Yeah, I will tell you, um, you know, I'm, I started by saying that in 2015, I was going around asking people if there's a pandemic in 2020, will the world be ready? Um, the model I was using, if you had asked me this question in 2015, uh, will we have a pandemic? I would have said, yes, undoubtedly in the next decade. Uh, and then if you had said, so tell me about what that pandemic is likely to look like, I would say it's a virus. It comes from China and it's an influenza virus. And so why China? Because all this economic growth, all this, all the stuff that China is doing, it's not about Chinese culture. The next virus may not come from China, may come from India, may come from uh, Africa, uh, the African continent, may come from Latin America. Um, but influenza virus, and the one that we're all super worried about is the one that has a 10% fatality rate. And by the way, if we had that, it would have been tens of millions of Americans who would have died by now. It would have just been awful. So um, that's what we got to prepare for uh, because that's still, that risk hasn't like gone away because we have this one. So yeah, this one I felt like was bad and we got a little bit lucky. Um, and everybody uh, who is running the Biden team is fully aware of that. I think you're going to see a federal government that's going to prepare our country for that. Um, in 20. 17, uh, we held a symposium uh, where we uh, on prepare, preparing for the next pandemic, where we had our, our keynote speaker, Tony Fauci. And uh, Tony uh, said, uh, he said, I don't, he said, I worry about that influenza virus. I also worry about disease X, the virus that we've never heard of, the virus we've never seen. Um, what do we do about that? And so that is going to take a totally different strategy. Like, how do you prepare for a virus you can't predict? I think we can do a lot, not everything. Um, so you're going to see really big investments in all of those areas, uh, just because I don't think anybody really wants to go through what we just went through in 2020 again. Yeah, I I have to say I had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong that a little bit more than a decade ago, and in the Hong Kong park where there are the busts of the number of leaders who died responding to SARS, it was a wake up call, and I almost think that. We ought to all be learning from Vietnam and what they've been able to do. Correct. Um, in, in large been... part, you know, because they can't afford <laughs> the kind of uh, devastation overall. So I know we're coming to the end, and so I'm going to try and get us to a to a, 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 a unifying idea. This country, and this is going to be a surprise, is more polarized than ever. Yet healthcare is a critical issue. Are there key aspects of healthcare policy that could be unifiers? Um, in this polarized world, is it even worth trying? So it's always worth trying. Healthcare used to be a pretty unifying thing in the sense that, um, you know, you know, we fought about policy and the ACA was not unifying and there were lots of people, but on the basics of like the way Americans thought about nurses and doctors it was pretty bipartisan support. Um, the way most people felt about their local hospital was pretty bipartisan support. It was one of the few areas of our society that I often refer to as like kind of the DMZ of policy or of, of kind of society, right? The demilitarized zone, where we don't fight about, you know, Republicans and Democrats may have different views on policy, but they all love their doctors, they all love their nurses. Because these are people who are trying to like save our lives. Even some of that has gotten eroded in this pandemic where you've had really people going after doctors and hospitals and saying, all this stuff is fake because doctors are making money. I think that's been pretty corrosive. Um, I do think that there is going to be, again, uh, the fringe elements of, of our society you can't deal with, um, but a, there is a broad swath of people in the middle who wanna rebuild a health system that works for all of us. And doctors and nurses are not evil, far from it. And the hospitals are not evil, they're far from it. right? They've, been in incredible places. So I think there's an opportunity to bring people together, but it's going to require leadership and it's going to require uh, leadership that focuses on commonality and not on differences. And, uh, and I hope that we get that kind of leadership. And it's not just leadership in Washington, it's leadership in state houses and mayors and health systems. You know, one of the things that has often been brought up to me is like, I run a public health school and they're like, well, why do you 
spend so much time engaging with the public. And I feel like it's part of our jobs as leaders of public health institutions, of medical institutions, uh, to be public facing and to engage with the broader public and tell people, um, because I think it's a way to try to bring people together on these things. And, and I hope that while 2020 was both an awful year from a public health point of view, awful year from an economic point of view, awful year from a division point of view, that 2021 can be a better on all three fronts. Well, and I uh, wanna thank you so much. That's a wonderful, hopeful uh, point to end on. Um, I am hopeful, uh, I, just so you know, I'm taking bets on when we reach that happy day. Scott Gottlieb over the weekend said April, Fauci this afternoon said fall of 2021. You're falling right in the middle of July 4th. So call your bookie and your agent, let's make some money on figuring how we're gonna get through this all. And I wanna thank you so much for your generosity and your time and, and insights. It was a wonderful conversation. Megan, back to you. Yes, thank you both so much. Thank you, Dr. Ja. I feel like I have hope and I see the light. Um, so I'm glad that it's it's on it's in the distance, but we're we're on our way there. And thank you, Lynn, for moderating um, and bringing everyone's thoughtful questions to the forefront. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, we have one more event this month, uh, next Monday, December 14th at 12 noon, where we will have. Another esteemed uh, colleague from our uh, local market, um, Commissioner Dr. Arwadi from the Chicago Department of Public Health will be um, speaking. So you can learn more about that event and our other activities at the Healthcare Council's website, uh, www.hc3.health. Thank you again to both of our um, wonderful um, contributors to today's talk. Um, and I hope you all stay well. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Megan. Bye.